Hello and welcome to session two of the series in support of Earth Observations for Indigenous-Led Land Management. The presenters today are myself, Jenny Hewson, and David Hunt. I'm the Director of Habitat Monitoring and Climate Change Mitigation within the Betty and Moore Center for Science at Conservation International. And I will now pass it over to David for a quick introduction. Hi, uh, this is David Hunt, and I am the Spatial Coordinator for the Betty and Gordon Moore Center for Science at Conservation International. In this session, we will provide an overview of remote sensing concepts, the history and evolution of remote sensing, and the current and emerging remote sensing technologies for land management. First, we need to understand what is meant by earth observation and remote sensing. Earth observation essentially refers to the process of obtaining information from an object without being in direct contact with it. And more specifically, obtaining information from the land surface through sensors mounted on aerial or satellite platforms. And here we have some examples of remote sensing and the historical trajectory of remote sensing dating from balloon photography in the mid-1800s to the use of pigeons with cameras attached to their chests used for aerial reconnaissance and later aircraft with various camera configurations for reconnaissance and surveillance. And finally, the evolution of space-based remote sensing in the mid-1900s. As the technology has evolved, so have the Earth observation data and tools available for supporting a range of applications, including monitoring of change, whether that be land cover change, land use change, etc. Alerts to threats, whether that be fires that are occurring in a forest, illegal logging that is taking place, illegal deforestation, etc., etc. Earth observation data and tools are also used to inform land management decisions, as these data provide a synoptic view of an entire landscape and can do so repeatedly. And finally, earth observations are used to track progress towards goals, including, for example, in the development, monitoring of and verification of activities associated with the UN's RED initiative, to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, plus the role of carbon enhancement, as well as supporting the implementation and monitoring the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Because of the unique qualities and flexibility of Earth observation, it has much utility in supporting sustainable land management and can be critical for ecological threats to territories in terms of deforestation, fires, etc., for the mapping and in helping to resolve land tenure conflicts, for increasing knowledge of land use dynamics, for mapping indigenous land boundaries and understanding their context within surrounding areas, and for monitoring biodiversity. Now I'm going to show seven examples of the use of space-based earth observation and other remote sensing technologies to support different applications. This first one is a video from the European Space Agency of earth observation data used to monitor the trajectory of deforestation in Rondonia, Brazil between 1986 and 2010. In the east of this image, one can already see the deforestation that has occurred, these lighter colored tan and green rectangles. And this video will show its expansion from here, 
Much of the deforestation in this area is for industrial scale agriculture, particularly cattle ranching and soybean farming. This second example is a video from the European Space Agency. First, an Earth observing satellite sensor and the mechanics of how a sensor captures images of the Earth, in this case in these large swaths. And then the application of this technology in detecting threats from active fires and the resulting burned area. In this example, the fires were captured on the 21st, 22nd and 24th of August in different areas of Greece, including the island of Xanthe, as well as northeast and west of Athens. And finally, the extent of the burned area is visible afterwards. In this third example, we see the use of a different type of remote sensing data and technology. In this case, the application of drones for monitoring deforestation. In the first image on the left, we can see technicians managing the drone flight path. In the second image, we can see the deforestation boundary delineated on the imagery captured by the drone. And in this third image on the right, we can see a 3D image of the deforestation and surrounding vegetation that has been produced from the images captured by the drone. We'll spend a few more slides on the emerging use of drones in conservation later in this webinar. In this fourth example, we see the use of acoustic sensors in monitoring illegal logging through the detection of chainsaw sounds. In number one, we can see the acoustic sensors attached to a tree, and below that, the deployment of acoustic sensors in a region of a protected area in Peru. In number two, we can see the detection process used by the acoustic sensors to identify anomalies that represent chainsaw noise. And finally, the transmittance of this information as an alert to a mobile device, which could then, for example, be used by a park ranger to respond to the alert. In this fifth example, we're highlighting the use of remote sensing to monitor biodiversity through camera traps. Camera traps are increasingly used in conservation because they are inexpensive and they result in minimal disturbance to biodiversity. Generally, the camera is equipped with an infrared sensor that is triggered when it senses an animal. Camera traps have successfully been used to identify and track species, to discover how trends in populations are changing, to support ecotourism in terms of raising awareness of conservation. And Wildlife Insight, the URL given here, is an initiative that aims to harness the massive amount of camera trap photos and data that have been taken to date throughout the world and unite them through technology and science to understand the status of biodiversity in near real time. This next example shows the use of space-based Earth observations to monitor changes in land use dynamics over time through the mapping of land cover types. The European Space Agency's Climate Change Initiative, or CCI, is producing annual maps of land cover type at a spatial resolution of 300 meters.
Now we're zooming in on Mato Grosso, Brazil. And this video shows the expansion of agricultural croplands, resulting in forest loss over a 20 year period between 1995 and 2015. Next, we will travel to Shanghai, China, where we see the significant expansion in urban areas, the red areas, between 1995 and 2015, and the removal of forest in the south and southwest and concurrent expansion of cropland. And now we're in the Eastern Congo, where we can see the expansion of cropland, particularly rain-fed cropland, over the same 20-year period. And finally, moving west to Mar Chiquita, Argentina. Where the expansion of cropland into different forest types has resulted in both forest loss as well as impacts on the lake dynamics of Laguna Mar Chiquita and vital flooded forest and flooded shrub and grassland especially in the Northwest. And finally, an example of the use of Earth observation data to support participatory mapping activities with the example of boundary delineation for a native community in Alto Mayo, Peru, from session one. I will now pass it over to David for the next section. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Uh, so Jenny presented a number of applications of Earth observations and remote sensing. And now we can begin delving into what remote sensing is and how it actually works. And we will start by introducing one of the most common types of remote sensing, remote sensing using satellites. So satellite remote sensing is the acquisition of information about an object, landscape, or the Earth using satellites in orbit around the planet. But how does this actually work? Well, there are a number of important steps or components that make up a remote sensing stream. And these are, as seen on the screen, energy source or illumination, radiation and the atmosphere, interaction with the actual target object or surface, energy recording by the satellite sensor, transmission, receiving, and processing the information, interpretation and analysis of the information, and finally, the application of the data gathered. So now I'm going to discuss each of these components in a little more detail in the coming slides. Okay, so first there is the energy source or illumination, and this allows the subject to be visible to the satellite. This energy is often light or radiation produced by the sun, as seen in the diagram on the right. Since the sun is constantly producing energy, this is a great source of light for us to use in our remote sensing. Other energy sources can be used in this process too, like a satellite that produces its own energy, but this will be discussed in more detail later in the presentation. So this light would be most useful if it could interact with the objects that we want to study. Sometimes though, the Earth's atmosphere gets in the way of this incoming radiation. Some of this energy will be reflected back into space by the atmosphere and the clouds, and some of it will be absorbed into the atmosphere as heat. And some of it 
will pass right through the atmosphere and will be able to actually interact with the Earth's surface. The diagram on the right shows examples of light interacting with the atmosphere in different ways. Even the energy that is reflected or absorbed by the atmosphere can provide us with information, like the ability to observe pre precipitation. So different types of light will interact with the target object or even pass through the atmosphere in different ways. Normally, we think of light as just the range of wavelengths that humans can see. These, however, are just the wavelengths that our eyes are able to detect, not all of the wavelengths that exist. The diagram on the right shows the full electromagnetic spectrum with the different wavelengths of light. So if you look in the middle of the spectrum, that little rainbow section is the only bit that our eyes can see out of the whole spectrum of light. This means that there is a lot more light that could potentially be used in remote sensing. And in fact, satellite sensors are designed to be able to detect many of these wavelengths along the spectrum. They can often view visible light, just like our eyes and normal cameras, but they are also able to view longer wavelength light than our eyes can see, called infrared light and microwaves. So now we will look at how different objects actually interact with light. The reason that objects all around us appear to be different colors is that they interact with various wavelengths of light differently. Vegetation and, and plants absorb blue and red wavelengths of light, but will reflect green and infrared light away for a viewer to see. Because our eyes cannot see infrared light, we see vegetation as green. A satellite sensor can see and record this infrared light though. The graph at the bottom right shows the reflectance spikes at the green and infrared wavelengths. Water, on the other hand, will absorb more long wavelength light, such as infrared, red, and green light, and reflect shorter wavelengths, like blue. This is why water will normally look bluish. Settlements and minerals in the water will affect the way that light interacts and therefore changes the water's appearance. Soils interact fairly constantly across many wavelengths of light, which gives it its characteristic brown color. Soil reflectance is affected by many factors though, like moisture, texture, and mineral content. So these graphs that have appeared on the last few slides are called spectral signatures. These show how an object interacts with light of different wavelengths. If the object reflects a large portion of a certain wavelength, a spike will appear on the graph. This is useful because these known spectral signatures can be compared to the signatures measured in collected images to determine the type of object that a light is interacting with. This figure shows some well-established spectral signatures compared on the same graph to show how different objects interact with light differently. Okay, so now that we have actually discussed how light interacts with the target, we can discuss what happens when that light is then collected by the satellite sensor. As previously mentioned, sometimes the radiation interacts with the atmosphere. The satellite then needs to evaluate what caused this interference so it can be accounted for. Light from pavement and urban areas have a very distinct signature, which allows satellites to collect data on the development of an area. As mentioned before, vegetation reflects green and infrared light. This distinct signature allows forests and land cover changes to be observed by the satellite. Water's distinct signature allows water level changes and flooding events to be observed. Algal growth and sediment changes can also be observed by examining alterations to water's typical spectral signature. And grass, dirt, and soil reflect different types of radiation and have a fairly distinct spectral signature. So the video on this slide shows the European Space Agency's satellite system called Sentinel-2. 
There are two satellite systems, two satellites in the system, which make image collection more frequent. Flying 180 degrees apart, the Sentinel-2 satellites will gather <laughs> high resolution optical data of our planet. As a team, they can cover every spot on Earth at least once every five days. To do this, both satellites are equipped with a wide swan high resolution multispectral imager with 13 spectral bands. The satellite's combination of high resolution, extended spectral capabilities, a swath width of 290 kilometers, and the very frequent revisit times provide a new perspective and an unprecedented view of our planet. Okay, so this video mentioned that the satellite has 13 spectral bands. This means that there are 13 distinct types of radiation that the satellite can detect. Instead of having different reflectance values for every single wavelength, each wavelength band produces a value. For example, the red, green, and blue bands will each have their own value. So now that we have discussed how remote sensing generally works, we will go over the different types of remote sensing and the different options available. This is very important to effectively process the data collected and decide what option best suits your needs. So in general, there are two different types of remote sensing, and they are defined by the type of energy used to collect the data. The first option is passive remote sensing. Uh, this is remote sensing using a naturally occurring source of light, such as the sun, to collect data. The Sentinel-2 satellite from the previous video uses passive remote sensing. The other option is active remote sensing. This was briefly mentioned before, but active remote sensing is when the source of energy is part of the satellite system itself. Examples of this include radar and LIDAR, where light, like radio waves or a laser, is actually fired from the satellite and the radiation that is reflected back from the target will be used to map the terrain. So resolution in remote sensing refers to the quality and usability of the data that is collected. The first type of resolution that we will discuss is spatial resolution. This refers to the size of the pixels that make up the image. Images with smaller pixels allow the user to view areas in greater detail and are said to have a higher resolution. Images with larger pixels do not allow as great of detail to be discerned and would be used to identify general trends over a large area. These images are said to have low spatial resolution. This concept is illustrated in the figures at the bottom. Notice how the high resolution of the houses on a residential street on the left allow you to view the images in a lot greater detail than the images on the right that appear completely pixelated. So the next type of resolution is temporal resolution. This refers to the frequency at which images are captured in the same place on Earth. The more frequently an image is taken in the same place, the higher or finer the temporal resolution is. The diagram in the bottom shows how a satellite with a temporal resolution of 11 days will take an extra image every month when compared to a satellite with a lower temporal resolution of 16 days. So this table shows the spatial and temporal resolutions of a few of the most commonly used remote sensing satellites. As you can see, NASA and the USGS's, US Geological Survey's, Landsat 8 has a spatial resolution of 30 meters and a temporal resolution of 16 days. And NASA's MODIS sensor on the Aqua and Terra satellites has a spatial resolution ranging from 250 meters to 1,000 meters and a temporal resolution of one to two days. So as you can imagine, resolutions are one of the most important limiting factors in utilizing remote sensing data. You might think, why wouldn't you just use 
high spatial, high temporal resolution imagery. Unfortunately, there is often a trade-off in resolution quality. High spatial resolution tends to be accompanied by a low spatial resolution and vice versa. For example, as we mentioned, Landsat 8 has a 30 meter spatial resolution and a 16 day temporal resolution. And MODIS has a lower spatial resolution of 250 meters to one kilometer, but a much higher temporal resolution at one to two days. This is because images with higher spatial resolution have a smaller viewing area at any given time and therefore will take longer for the satellite to revisit the same location. Fortunately, emerging technologies are making this trade-off less of an issue. So with this information in mind, it is important to pick the most useful resolutions for your project. High spatial resolutions are useful for small study areas or examining an area in very fine detail, such as a town or a patch of forest. High temporal resolutions are very useful in dynamic and frequently changing environments. High temporal resolutions are also really useful in areas with high levels of cloud cover, like the scene in the bottom left, because with more frequent imaging, there is a greater likelihood of collecting a scene without clouds, like in the image on the bottom right. Okay, so now that you understand the background and principles of remote sensing, how do you actually use and interpret the data and imagery? So as mentioned before, remote sensing data comes in bands, which each represent a wavelength range. Each band comes as a separate image in the acquired data, and each pixel in that image shows a value with a measure of the intensity of the energy within that wavelength band. To get more meaningful information, these individual band images can be stacked on top of each other to view at once in different combinations of red, green, and blue channels on the computer. For example, if you stack the red, green, and blue wavelength band images and assign them to be seen as red, green, and blue colors or channels on the computer screen, you will get a true color composite, like the one seen on the bottom left. This process mimics how our eyes detect color and is therefore how you would view the scene if you were in the satellite. You can also stack other bands together that are not in the visible, visible part of the spectrum to get what are called false color composites. These composites take wavelengths humans cannot see and assign them visible color analogs so they can be visualized. The image in the bottom right is a stack of the near infrared, red, and green bands in the red, green, and blue channels. So this means that on the computer screen, the near infrared band was assigned the color red, the red band was assigned the color green, and the green band was assigned the color blue. This allows us to visualize colors we cannot normally see, and therefore view features in the landscape we may otherwise miss. So to understand larger patterns within images, pixels of similar values can be grouped together in what are called classifications. These groups can represent certain land cover types or phenomena on the Earth's surface. For example, all the pixels that display characteristics of vegetation can be put into one group, and all pixel values that display characteristics of water can be put in another group. This image on the right is a global land cover classification, where the landscape has been grouped into 18 different land cover types. These land cover maps can be incredibly useful in visualizing and evaluating changes in landscapes over time, such as deforestation and land degradation. The GIF on the right shows deforestation classification map from the Peruvian Amazon. Instead of classifying by all land cover types, this map has been classified by deforestation year. So green is the existing forest, 
and each progressive decade of tree loss is represented by a new color. So this video shows how imagery from a satellite can be turned into definitive numbers of deforested area by measuring the area of forest cover change in classified images. Okay, so now I'm gonna hand it back over to Jenny to talk about current and emerging remote sensing technologies. Thank you, David. Now that you have a background on remote sensing concepts, as well as the history and evolution of remote sensing, we'd like to highlight the current and emerging remote sensing technologies for land management. One of the primary satellite sensors that has been used for Earth observing is Landsat. The Landsat series has a history dating back to 1972 with the launch of Landsat 1, right through to the present day with Landsat 8, or LCDM under the Landsat Data Commun Con Continuity Mission, currently in orbit, and collecting imagery at 30 meter resolution every day in different locations. Landsat has been called the workhorse because of its long legacy in providing vital images of the Earth. However, Landsat is only one sensor in the suite of NASA's current constellation of satellites that monitor the land, climate, and atmosphere as they orbit around the Earth. The European Space Agency also has a number of recently launched satellites that are monitoring the Earth as part of its Copernicus program, including the Sentinel-2 satellites mentioned earlier. The Sentinel-2 satellites were designed to complement the Landsat satellites and add to the number of images available to track and monitor phenomena on Earth and in the atmosphere. These data are freely available to the public. Additionally, as more Earth observing data becomes available, so too do the number of data portals to access the increasing range of data including, for example, the USGS's Earth Explorer for accessing Landsat, Sentinel, MODIS imagery and others, the European Space Agency's Sentinel Hub to access the Sentinel series data, 
Global Fire Data, accessible through the Fire Information for Resource Management System of firms, and Global Forest Change Data, produced by Hansen et al. at the University of Maryland. Concurrent with the number of data portals available to distribute the expanding range of Earth observation data, is the range of freely available open source software and tools for image analysis, including QGIS, Google Earth, the SNAP toolbox available from the European Space Agency to support the analysis of Sentinel data, the Landsat Explorer app that will be demonstrated later in this webinar, as well as advanced webinars and applied trainings available through, for example, NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET. And I will now pass it back to David to discuss additional remote sensing options. Okay, so one important technology that has really been gaining a lot of momentum recently is drone remote sensing. So drone remote sensing is when a camera or sensor is mounted on a drone and used to collect imagery. So this means that instead of having to rely on a government or large company to launch a satellite and collect and provide a bunch of data, anyone can do it themselves for a price as low as $1,000. And so there are two different types of drones, multi-rotor drones and fixed wing drones. Multi-rotor drones are the type of drones seen in the picture on the right and function similar to helicopters. These drones provide high levels of user control like the ability to move forwards and backwards. And this means that they can do complex, precise missions. Fixed wing drones function similarly to airplanes and have less control, but longer flight times and larger ranges. Recent advances in drone technology have reduced the cost of aircraft sensors and drone imagery processing software significantly. So now I am going to go over a case study where drone remote sensing was used as part of a deforestation alert system in Altamayo, Peru. So the general purpose of this effort was to detect deforestation and selective cutting. And this would be accomplished by generating rapid responses to protected areas of interest. So this system would have quite a number of advan advantages over other data collection techniques, such as satellites. First of all, this option can allow the collection of high resolution data for low costs, whereas satellite data with a resolution higher than 10 meters can be very expensive. These drones can also be deployed whenever the user is available, which allows more control and more frequent imaging than waiting for satellite revisit times that can be long as long as a couple of weeks. Drone data capture is also not as impacted by cloud cover as satellites because they mostly fly below the cloud level. And this is particularly useful in areas like Altamayo that have very consistently high levels of cloud cover. So the first step in this system is that multiple acoustic sensors were set up throughout the region. If these sensors were triggered by a loud noise like a chainsaw or large equipment, an email alert is sent out to the Peruvian National Forest Conservation Program. And so now the drones are actually used. Based on the information in the alert, the study area and the flight parameters for the drones can be established and the drone can be brought to the field. And once in the field, the first task is to verify that the alert was actually correct to ensure that there is in fact illegal activity. All of the takeoff spots in this process were recorded using Survey123, a data gathering and sharing app that we will discuss in the next week's session.
So now, all of the data collected by the drones during their flights, like the imagery below, are analyzed and processed using remote sensing software. All detections of illegal activity are then recorded in Survey123 for subsequent analysis and display. These results can be published onto ArcGIS Online for future analysis and processing. This allows policymakers to view the information collected and act accordingly. And as a result of this process, through the participation of park rangers and the local public, special patrols were created. And this made a system where offenders could be reported and investigations could be launched. Using patterns in the data, this project also showed in which areas intervention was easiest. This provides information about where greater surveillance could be used in the future. Overall, this project was a great success and led to the reductions of Ill illegal activity and encroachment, as well as deforestation in general. Okay, so I've thrown a lot of concepts at you today, and these can be really difficult to comprehend without some kind of visualization. So I'm going to be giving a demonstration of a very useful tool called the Landsat Explorer application that will allow you to apply the concept that I have introduced. So first, I'm going to go to the URL link here to visit the application. And so when this page loads, it should show the agricultural rendering of Southern California. So now we're going to navigate to Limoncocha in Ecuador using the search bar. And so you're going to pick this first option in Shushu Findi. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is examine a few different dates to look at image quality. So as you can see here, the image is fairly clear, and there are only a few clouds in the top of the window. So we're going to click the time selector icon in the left here to bring up this window. The image immediately switches to an image from October of 2016 that is just completely clouded over. Click the Show Dates by drop-down list button so we can view the options more easily. And so the first data in this comparison we will pick is September 2nd, 2013, right here. We can click the set current as secondary layer button. And now we can pick that cloudy image from October 28, 2016. So now if we click the swipe button over here and move the time selector window out of the way, we can slide the image back and forth to reveal the different layers. See how these images compare? In the right, you can see almost no features. And on the left, the image is quite clear. So this is one of the biggest difficulties with remote sensing in the tropics, as clouds will often get in the way of observation. Uh, this is why it's useful to use satellites with high temporal resolution and more frequent images, or you can use drones that fly below the clouds. So now we are going to exit out of the time selector window and deselect the time selector and the swipe options. So as you can see, and I mentioned before, this view shows the agricultural rendering and consists mostly of bright greens and magentas. 
So early in the presentation, we mentioned that you can view images in different ways by stacking different bands. Now let's take a look at this. So first, I will select the renderer option to pull up this window. Now, using the dropdown, you can select a number of different image options. First, we will look at the natural colors or the true colors. As I mentioned before, a true color composite is the red, green, and blue bands in the red, green, and blue channels. This is how the image would appear from space, with maybe some slight color variations. You can also click this question mark to view more information. So there are many other options available to explore. Uh, now I will select the color infrared option. This option is a false color composite and uses a new and near infrared band, red and green in the red, green and blue channels. This option uses colors that we can see to represent light that we can't see. This is a very powerful tool. And again, click the question mark if you want more information. So there are many other options available to explore, and I encourage you to do the homework and play around with a few more of them. One very interesting option is the custom band selection. Here, you can select the bands you want to use yourself to highlight different features. Okay, but now I'm going to send, set the setting back to natural colors and exit out of that window. So now I'm going to ex examine the change that happens between two images in more detail. Once again, I'm going to select the time selector icon and choose show dates in drop down list, which is already selected. Now I do not want any clouds in my image, so I will select May 25th, 2009 and select, and select set current as secondary layer. And then I will click September 2nd, 2013 for the cloudless comparison date. Okay, so once I click the change detection icon, I can view the change in vegetation between these two dates. So green areas appear to have increased in vegetation, while magenta areas appear to have decreased in vegetation. So this can also be due to cloud cover changes between the two images. So there are also additional types of imagery measurements or indices you can view along with other types of change detection methods, such as a difference mask. These options will all be explored further in the homework assignment for this week, so I highly encourage you to complete it. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Jenny to conclude this week's session. Great, well, thank you, David. So David has demonstrated the Landsat Explorer app and the potential to examine and explore multiple dates of imagery using different band combinations, different indices, etc. And there will be an opportunity to further explore the Landsat Explorer app in the homework. In summary, today during session two, we have covered what is Earth observation and remote sensing, as well as its evolution. What are the uses and significance of Earth observations and remote sensing? We've reviewed the principles of remote sensing and data analysis, as well as a number of the most important Earth observing satellites. We presented an overview of drone remote sensing and its emerging uses. 
And finally, we provided an introduction and demonstration of the Landsat Explorer app. This week's homework aims to help participants become familiar with the Landsat Explorer remote sensing web application through exploring a range of tasks, including analyzing band combinations and spectral signatures, using masks, and change detection. The homework can be found on the materials webpage. All of the instructions are in the homework document. And please complete the homework by the beginning of next week's webinar session, session number three. Next week's session of this webinar series in support of Earth Observations for Indigenous-led land management will review applications for sustainable land management decisions and early warning and alert systems. Topics to be covered include using near real-time data for tracking global change, a discussion of the top five applications of early warning systems, and an introduction to important web-based and mobile applications. Thank you, and we will now have a question and answer section. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for tuning in to the second session of our EO4IM RSET webinar. Uh, so I'm now going to begin answering the questions that were asked in the chat window. The format will be the same as last week. I will read the questions asked and then answer them as the answers are being written down. Uh, so I know that the hour session is almost over, so don't worry if you need to leave before we finish. The recording will be available in about 24 hours, and the Q&A page will be available in about a week. Okay, so the first question is, is it possible to use QGIS for analyzing drone remote sensing images? Uh, yes, this is definitely possible. Um, you may want to install some QGIS plugins for additional functionality, like open aerial map, but you can definitely use QGIS to do this. <clears throat> okay, so second question, uh, do you have any suggestions for software which can combine satellite images with medium resolution with drone images. Um, yeah, as in the last question, QGIS can definitely be used to do both of these things. Um, other software like Envy and AirDOS can be used, but licenses are really expensive. Uh, some other things that we mentioned in the uh, webinar, like Snap, can also be used. Um, you can check out the font like that link that's written down there, conservationdrones.org, for a bit more information. Okay, so how can effective land management be achieved in the phase of paucity of high-resolution satellite data, especially in the developing world? Uh, okay, so effective land management can be achieved with moderate or coarse resolution data. Uh, these data sets have many advantages over high resolution data sets. Uh, first, they are free and they can have higher temporal resolutions, as we mentioned, repeat rates, uh, so that you can get more frequent looks at the landscape. Uh, this is particularly advantageous in very cloudy regions like the tropics, as we saw in uh, the Landsat Explorer app. And also, moderate to coarse resolution imagery are easier to analyze with open source software. High resolution imagery sometimes requires specialized and really expensive software to use. Um, high resolution data is not always the best option. It really depends on what features in the landscape you are interested in and how frequently you will need to monitor the features. Okay. Uh, so how can I estimate forest carbon percent by using UAVs uh, and DSM or DTMs? And one technique is structure for motion. That, that can be used to get an estimate of canopy structure from optical drone remote sensing. 
Uh, you can also use LiDAR. Um, this is preferred, but it's harder to come by. It's more expensive. Um, but that, that can be used very effectively to estimate canopy structure. Uh, Ground-based measurements of biomass are required to estimate carbon values. Uh, once you have the different canopy structures, you can use that uh, density and the ground information that you have to, to create effective carbon maps. Okay, question five. Uh, what types of water quality characteristics are available in and around Tongo? Um, there's, uh, so for, for additional water quality information, you can look into RSET's previous water quality we uh, webinars, uh, like the link seen below. Um, yeah, so when, when this Q&A sheet comes out, you can, you can follow that link and uh, look at the previous webinar. All right. How do you test whether a place on Earth observed by a satellite is what it actually is? For instance, is a forest or a grassland? Is it a water body or a soil land with high moisture? Uh, so one thing that is really important for remote sensing is field validation. Uh, you're not really, you, you can trust what satellites, what you can see from satellite imagery for sure, but to really get truly accurate representations, you need field validation. Um, somebody goes to the location, collects information, what's actually there. Um, high resolution can also be used if you want to look at very small areas and uh, look at very detailed information. Question seven, um, for multispectral images, how can I make classification of rocks, whether it be sedimentary or igneous or metamorphic, based on spectral signatures generally and more specifically using decision tree classification. I know this can be done using hyperspectral images, that's true, um, but due to limited availability of hyperspectral sensors, I hope to know how to classify different types of rocks in multispectral images. Um, yeah, Landsat can be definitely used for classification in geology. Uh, I don't have, yeah, I, as the answer says, I don't have too much experience uh, with geological classifications. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Karen has any more information on it, but I, I unfortunately can't really answer this question very effectively. Um, so if not, I'll move on to question eight. Uh, does a stressed plant mean low chlorophyll concentration have a reflectance necessarily for making image classification, for example, a land cover map. Um, so there are remote sensing indices specifically to monitor drought stress in plants. NDVI is a common indice or index to monitor drought conditions. Uh, EVI, which is uh, enhanced vegetation index, can also be used. Um, Landsat 8 has a band designed for monitoring drought stress in agriculture specifically. <clears throat> okay, so question nine, um, which of the free tools mentioned are most user-friendly for participants that are very new to remote sensing? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so if you're brand new to remote sensing, um, I would say, so the Landsat Explorer application, while you can't really do much analysis, I think is a really great introductory tool, um, just because it really gets you familiar with the, the types of general analyses that can be done, and uh, it, it gets you kind of a visualization of what different bands do, how clouds affect imagery. Um, but after that, hmm. That's, that's a good question. Maybe, so, so QGIS is not too complicated to use if you're doing very simple processes. Um, I'd say some of the easiest software to use, unfortunately, is some of the software that does cost a bit more money. Um, the Snap Toolbox is, is fairly easy to use. They have a lot of tools that, um, like you can calculate an NDVI straight from the menus. You can um, 
Yeah, do all sorts of different types of analyses, very simply. Um, but I'd say pretty much all of the remote sensing softwares do have a bit of a learning curve. Um, so wondering the location of the land image on your cover page and whether the image is an area of decreasing forest cover. Uh, so the image is, yeah, from Bolivia, um, but I, I don't know uh, exactly what's going on in that, in that region, unfortunately. Okay, so next question. Uh, is it possible that some of the satellite images are not accurate because they are blocked for sensitivity? Uh, like in military areas, and how can you tell that that's the case? Uh, yeah, this is this is definitely the case sometimes. I unfortunately also don't know a ton about um, sensitive data in regions, but I, I do know that this is definitely possible. Um, so is it possible to use remote sensing to calculate carbon stocks of forests? Uh, yeah, this is this is definitely possible. Uh, there are even data sets that already have this information at uh, down to 30 meter resolution. Um, they'll have above ground biomass and you can calculate additional types of like uh, soil carbon. Um, if to there is one tool that effectively does this in in QGIS called trends.earth, you can calculate uh, carbon and carbon emissions uh, using this tool. Um, so you, you take deforestation data and the above ground biomass within the deforested regions and you can calculate carbon emissions as well. Okay, so next question, let's see. So how can I measure NDVI using Landsat 8 images with maximum accuracy? Um, as in my sample area, there are no images for some months with less than 10% cloud cover. Hmm. Yeah, so clouds, uh, I, clouds definitely pose a big problem. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, if, um, yeah, it, sometimes, unfortunately, that will definitely interfere with, uh, with analysis. You could use coarser resolution data sets, for sure. MODIS, VIRS, uh, MODIS has an NDVI and EVI product that you can download straight from Earth Explorer. Uh, but it is fairly coarse. I think it's 250 meter resolution. Uh, so if you're looking for a higher spatial resolution than that, uh, unfortunately, it would be difficult in areas with high cloud cover. Um, if you have a large enough time period sample size, you, you could do it. Um, and you could just also look for many different types of imagery. You could use Landsat, you could use Sentinel to try to get as many images as possible. Um, okay, so what drones maker slash model can you recommend to work with in the tropics? Uh, yeah, I, I unfortunately do not know the answer to this as well, but we do have experts who work with drones all the time in Peru and Ecuador. Uh, so uh, we can definitely ask them and then write a more elaborate answer uh, once we get a bit more information. Okay. So I heard there were digital signatures that can be used to quickly classify land cover use. Where can we get these signatures and how can they be used? Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what this means. Um, I'm waiting to see what's being written down. Spectral signatures. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I, I'm. Yeah, I'll I'll get back to that question. Maybe if if you want to email that email address that you sent the first homework to, and we we can elaborate on uh, on that that answer. 
Okay, so how should I pick the timing of conducting field work for validation when I don't know if the satellite image will be, afflect, be affected by clouds or not? Um, so yeah, it's, it's easiest to work in the dry season. Um, that way you not only will have an easier time in the field, but you will be able to more effectively compare your results to the remote sensing data because it's less likely that clouds will get in the way. Okay, which band combination in Landsat Explorer are best suited to study developing urban sprawl patches uh, going further than monitoring the shrinking of green coverage? So there's actually an urban index that is built into uh, Landsat Explorer that you can use. Um, we didn't go over it in the demonstration, but it will be discussed in the homework a bit. So uh, definitely take a look at that. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, you can definitely use things like a vegetation index uh, or agricultural index to see shrinking vegetation or expanding agriculture. But there is a, uh, an urban index that is specifically designed to measure uh, urban sprawl. <clears throat> Okay, uh, question 20, are there cases of indigenous-led participatory mapping and use of drones either supported positive action or obstructed or even forbidden by laws in any country? Can indigenous local organizations use these technologies freely anywhere in the world? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there, there will be different policies in different cities regarding drone use. Um, yeah, if, I don't know a ton about drone laws, um, but as Karen is typing, uh, drones are not allowed uh, in DC at all. Um, if, if Karen wants to elaborate a bit on this, since I don't know a ton, um, but if she's not available, yeah, then... Yeah, I'm here. Um, okay. So I was just Typing. I mean, this is an excellent, excellent question. Uh, where David and I live in the Washington, D.C. area, um, you're actually not allowed to use drones at all because of a lot of military um, installations, the Pentagon. So um, I, I'm not aware of the different laws in different places in the U.S. or the world. And, and I know that there are there can be issues um, using drones, especially with some governments don't like using and I'm not sure of how um, the, the conflict between like indigenous groups and their laws of being able to use drones and the government. But it's um, it's definitely an interesting question and something that we could try to ask uh, more of our uh, team who actually work with indigenous communities and also work with the drones and see if they have come across any of these issues and we can definitely Yeah, the, the only thing that I can really add to that is um, where I went to uh, grad school at the University of Edinburgh, you, you needed specific licenses to, to fly drones, um, especially for any sort of commercial use. Um, but yeah, uh, other than that, I'm, I'm not sure about all the, all the local laws. Uh, but if you have any specific questions, uh, you can either, the information will be on the internet or uh, reach out to us and maybe we can we can uh, ask one of our local field offices. Okay, next question. Can you suggest me the most effective atmospheric correction process of Landsat imageries? Uh, I have used flash atmospheric correction of Envy, but some regions of my mountainous area become blank after doing, especially on mountain slope areas. Uh, yeah, so they have pre-processed Landsat imagery that is available at, on Earth Explorer. So um, you typically don't need to do the atmospheric corrections yourself. Um, so There is yeah. um, options. I mean, if you prefer doing your own, uh, it's in a couple of years since I did atmospheric correction um, ever since that it becomes already um, corrected. So uh, I'm a little rusty on the atmospheric correction technique. I know at one point, we were using, uh, it was an open source uh, correction tool in R. Um, 
but again, I'm I'm not as sure. But I, again, we could uh, ask around to some of our colleagues and see if what they're using and what they recommend. Yeah, I know that Sentinel Two, the their atmospherically corrected product, is still um, in in beta and uh, not widely available. So you definitely need to atmospherically correct your Sentinel-2 imagery. Um, and you can do that in the SNAP toolbox. But for Landsat, yeah, I haven't um, atmospherically corrected that in a, in a long time. OK, so do you, ex do you suggest any version or extension of QGIS for drone data analysis? Uh, yeah, as the answer says, we can, we can ask our drone experts and give you an answer uh, by the time this, this Q&A uh, the sheet is released. OK, so it looks like that is all the questions. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your great questions and participating in the webinar. And we will see you next week.